about it. And this new form of capitalism I'm calling social response capitalism. M many of you have probably grown up last century in reading the works of Deming and Duran and the Quality Revolution. And that is very much 20th century capitalism, where many of the critical product decisions of better cars or better computers or better homes were based on a balanced evaluation of technical quality, zero defects, and price. Now, what I'm beginning to sense is happening, and again, I'm trying to do this as a social historian, is that one of the major shifts is that more and more companies, not all of them, not the majority of them, but the significant ones that are growing, are now competing on a larger triangle by searching for better products like Toyota's hybrid powertrain, Whirlpool's duet series, HP's all-in-one series. They're also evolving better leaders that are evolving just in seven years this new form of capitalism. So let me talk a little bit about that before I flip. The first thing that I think you can think about when you're instituting your sustainable enterprise efforts is the immediacy of this change. It is not slow. When Toyota chose to go the route of the hybrid powertrain, now, they essentially, from 99 to 2007, in eight years, doubled the efficiency of what it took 25 years to occur through the corporate average fleet efficiency standards under the Clean Air Act, all right? So the average American car went from 12.8 miles per gallon to 26.4 miles per gallon roughly at the end of last century. And there's been a lot of stag stagnant lobbying by automakers, particularly American automakers, but now also Toyota, to not to upgrade that law. But Toyota pursued this uh, social response on hybrid powertrains that doubled the doubling, right, much, much faster than regulation is. So I began asking myself, why is this happening? And why is there are some new markets to capture. Next slide, please. So if you read the chapter in the book called Social Response Capitalism, what I really believe is that the answer to sustainability is product efficiency. That one feature of sustainability that is inescapable is the rising price of energy. And therefore, the forces that are changing the things of interest to all of you in your future are not necessarily more rules. I am definitely, if you look at all my works, I'm definitely a person who believes that government enables change through rulemaking. But we're also seeing some forces here in society that are moving faster. So essentially, by using price, quality, and social needs in products, the first third of my new book is giving plenty of examples of how that's happening. I think all of you who are on boards, all of you that are working within companies also know that issues of the price of energy, the rising price of electricity, the rising price of natural gas are all indicating that these are significant internal issues for companies both large and small. So give you a couple of examples before I move past that one. From the year 1995 to the year 2000, in North America, the average homeowner had their utility bill increase about 4.2%, compounded across 60 months or five years. From 2000 to 2005, when I was writing this book, that rate of electricity increase increased 16.8%. So it's roughly a 400% rate of increase due to difficulties in siting, due to difficulties of supply, due to uh, power grid issues, many issues, just like the rising price of oil, which I'll show you in a minute. So sustainability is actually inside the corporate mansion now as an issue of the price of energy, a hedge against that rising price. So one of our clients, for example, Mel Jones of Sterling Planet, is selling renewables on 10-year hedges to large companies like Staples because renewables are probably going to increase less expensively than conventional fuels. So this is a new development that's quite significant. 
We're also developing products and services that respond to legitimate emerging social pressures and needs. So these are some of the changes I'm seeing. I'm seeing it at HP, I'm seeing it at Whirlpool, I'm seeing it at Toyota, I'm seeing it at every company that's beginning to think of itself in today's global equity market. So I told you about Stu Hart's book. I also suggest those of you that are learning in this area rapidly, you check out a man who's not too far from here, Mark Smith, who's in New York City, and he's written an important Wall Street book called The Global Equity Culture. So today is a historic day because 20 years ago we had a Black Monday and the stock market boomed and busted. All right? And today the thinking is that Mark Smith is indicating is that we have a global equity culture where many, many, many more investors are balancing the risk than ever before. All right? So I suggest you read that because I think this is explaining how some of these firms are acting and how I describe it in my PowerPoint. So the last third of my book, and I'm just giving you the overview, is on money matters. And I, I want to give you a sense of these because there's some people in the room that are actually far more expert at, on this than I am. But there are these third-party valuation entities that are another ground of hope. The Standard & Poor's, the Innovests, the DNVs, the Fitches, the Moody's, and the best way I'd like you to think of them as I move on in my presentation is think of them as helicopters above a crime scene, okay? And if you think of, I remember my Uncle Frank, who was a policeman, said that uh, whenever you couldn't see something from the street, you had to rent a helicopter and get above it, right? And so another change of capitalism from last century to this new century is that people like Deming and others uh, Duran, the great gurus, always felt that there was a classical suspicion between the seller and the buyer, that there was an A and B issue of disclosure between the buyer and the seller, the buyer who buy, might be snooped and the seller who was into marketing and, and deception. Today, because of the swiftness of information, it's a triangle again, and there's a third party that's telling TXU, that's telling HP, that they need to invest more reliably in social issues that have a sustained value. And I think that these third parties are really super grounds for hope. So I see in a simple way, those are the five or six elements of social response capitalism that I talk about in a pretty extensive chapter. Now, to demonstrate it in a more popular way, I'd like to go to the next slide. In the beginning when I was writing the book, I felt that maybe this was just a curiosity of automaking with Toyota or a curiosity of high tech with HP and Dell. But when Business Week begins to show you that there's an avalanche of competition on social elements within different industries, then you have something significant happening. And so you see in household products, you see Philips, you see Sunny, you see large Japanese electric conglomerates competing with GE and Whirlpool on efficiency. And you see the duet series of Whirlpool selling better in Brazil and China than even Whirlpool thought, right? So it's competition on product efficiency in a new classical, it's classical, but it's a new way. You see, you see here in the high tech space, you see Toshiba and Dell and Hewlett Packard initiating things. We don't have time this morning to get into each of them, but one of the key features of an avalanche, for those of you who've ever experienced it, in the first second, the snow comes down almost this way, but in the second second, it starts fanning out like that. And I think what this Business Week article is about is that due to the swiftness of information, a HP or a Toyota doesn't only need to compete within its own industrial sector for new human talent, for new capital. It needs to compete against all the firms that are moving in this global equity culture so that examples of leadership are now cross-sectoral, right? And so that's the point I wanted to convey moving here. If we can go to the next slide, we're going to design this in such a way that there's plenty of time for input. I think you know that my first book 
came out in 1984. 